And there's a big difference between somebody teaching you about transgender issues and teaching you the terminology and teaching you what to say and what not to say versus hearing somebody's story. I learned about this suicide attempt rate is 50% for kids before they turn 20. 50% of all transgender kids will try to kill themselves. You know, when I went through this, my parents didn't have any success stories to turn to. There was nothing, they couldn't look at someone who went through this and be like, okay, well, look at this person. Mm -hmm. You know, Chris could turn out like them, and yeah. that would be fine. Yeah. That would be great. Mm -hmm. And I feel that if there are more people like me who share their story, parents will have that, kids will have that, mm -hmm. and they'll they'll see that there is hope. Welcome to another episode of the Face World Podcast, where I share conversations with a personal collection of mentors I've met from Beijing to Boston along the way of exactly, I Google this obviously, 6,729 miles. Thanks to the digital age as well, because I can now connect with people I have never met before, places I've never traveled to. It's a jumble of order and chaos, head and heart. After I had the pleasure to interview Dory Clark, she, by the way, is the author of an amazing book called Stand Out, How to Find Your Breakthrough Idea and Build a Following Around It. She immediately introduced me to a new guest named Chris Edwards. Chris is the author of the book called Balls. It takes some to get some. Because, quote, changing your gender from female to male takes balls. And if you are going to do it in front of 500 co-workers at the largest ad agency in Boston, you better have a pretty big set. Prior to focusing on balls as a freelance writer, Chris was the EVP Group Creative Director at Arnold Worldwide. Yep, that's the company I've been working for for the past two years. I can't wait to read Balls and then it will be published in 2016. It hasn't been published yet, so the release date will be announced on Face World as soon as I have the information. For now, I'd like to invite you in joining me and Chris in a very personal journey, a personal conversation with him. The transition took years and it was very successful, but it was a period of time that was also very painful for Chris. He made a decision, however, to step out of his comfort zone and tell a story a success story that others, including transgender people, their families, parents, friends, and everyone else can relate to and to understand what it means to us, what it means to be human. Kristen and I laugh plenty on this podcast. So you see, learning new things don't always have to be painful. Chris teaches a valuable lesson on how we can all just get along better. What's offensive to ask? and what's okay and what not to beat yourself up as long as you try. It's an amazing experience for me to connect with such an authentic soul, a beautiful, a generous soul, and a great storyteller who's absolutely engaging to listen to. So if you like this episode, please make sure to visit phaseworld.com and check out my other conversations I've recorded in the past. I created a Phase World podcast starter guide that helps you navigate content that's most relevant and compelling to you. Without further ado, please welcome Chris Edwards. I've been very pleased with everything I've learned about you. And um, personally, I thought the podcast with Jordan Harbinger on The Art of Charm was phenomenal. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I was, first of all, I was so glad he did it because I was searching for similar, you know, podcasts. And for me, I listen to all of them before I interview my guests. Oh, that's good. You're prepared. Always prepared. Yes. I read the books, but in this case, I couldn't okay, read your well, book. you'll have to read it when it comes out. I have to, and I'll write a review. Okay, great. I write all the Amazon reviews and, um, I, you know, it's... It's such a, I mean, not to be so selfish, it's such a phenomenal experience for me. So, um, yeah. I'm flattered. <laughs> you know, when I chatted with a number of coworkers here at Arnold, this is your, sort of your comfort zone. Mm -hmm. Actually, what, what did it, how does it feel like to be back well, in the agency? it's weird now because I never worked in this new location, so it's a little weird. Yeah. Um, and it's, you know, see, I, I left three years ago. 
So mm -hmm. I come in here and I feel old, number one. Um, but I did, I did walk in and I saw five people that I, I used to work with, which is great. Yeah. Um, it's great to see them. Everybody hugged you. Yes. They, uh, it's nice to feel welcome. And, and, uh, I have a few people I need to go see before I leave. Mm -hmm. Um, but it, it is a little, it is a little surreal to walk around here and not know where I'm going, mm -hmm. <laughs> not know where thing. I am, not know where I'm going and see so many young people that I've never seen before and it just mm. seems like it's a you know it's just evolved into a, a, the next generation Arnold yeah I started to feel a little bit old in agencies as well you? everybody's like in their 20s it's I crazy know, it, it is crazy yeah it's, crazy. it's a young business yeah very but you're as young as you feel that's what I say and in my head I am always 37 <laughs> Why, why that number? Why 37? I don't know. 37? Yeah. It just seems like that was that was a good time in my life, and I just mm -hmm. felt balanced, and that was, I don't know, that was a good time. And I just kind of, uh -huh. I have in my mindset when someone asks me how old I am, I always have to think because I want to say 37, Yeah. but I know that's a lie. So I, I have a feeling that when I release this podcast, a lot of the people from Arnold, people I have worked with in the past, is going to jump right on it, um, assume they, they know you and they know your story. But mm -hmm. I also have a set of audience who have not um, heard from mm -hmm. you, have not read your book. So Well, you know, it's funny that you say that because, mm -hmm. you know, I was at Arnold so long, mm -hmm. um, just over 19 years, almost 20 years. And wow. when, I, when I first announced, you know, Mm -hmm. that I was uh, going to be transitioning. Of course, everybody knew. Uh, and for years, everybody knew. And my transition took took years. I think a lot of people think it's like a one-and-done surgery type of thing, but it's not. Mm -hmm. um, but because the ad industry, the changeover, mm -hmm. people hop around from agency to agency. It's very rare for someone to stay at one place as long as I did. Right. Um, but... Because of that turnover, especially creatives turnover two to three years, there was a time when a, a long many years when I was here when I didn't know who knew and who didn't know, mm, and a lot of people didn't know, and I could kind of tell when they didn't know if I sort of made a joke or a reference to it in you know in a in a subtle way, mm. and then. People would, some people would just be squinting, like, what? Like, not get the, not get the joke or the reference. Uh, and then, actually, one of my friends um, had said to me, uh, you know, I, I managed a McDonald's account for, nine, for the last nine years I was here. It's a big account. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of account people, way more than creatives. And um, one of the newer junior account people had said to her supervisor, Hey, um, I heard a rumor that there's a creative director here who used to be female and changed genders. Is that true? And her supervisor was like, yep. Mm -hmm. She's like, well, who is it? <laughs> and she said, it's Chris, the creative director that you work with. Make her guess. And she was, she couldn't believe it. You know what I mean? Yeah. So. I, I, it's it's funny and it's great because that's all I ever wanted. You know, I never wanted mm -hmm. my transition to define me, mm -hmm. um, which is what is a little bit challenging for me now as I've written this book and I'm trying to get it published and speaking and doing all these things. Um, it is defining me. Mm -hmm. So for the last two years or so, it has been defining me, and it, I got to say, it's been a struggle. It's been a struggle for me. I'm not. I'm not used to that, and it's um, never what I wanted, mm -hmm. but I feel that it's so important um, to share my story yeah. right now that I feel like, well, i, I got to take one for the team, Yeah, because it's, it's kind of like going through this all over again, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. There were a lot of people who didn't know. I had neighbors who didn't know, mm -hmm. um, newer friends who didn't know, um, my trainer. You mm -hmm. know, there were, mm -hmm. there were a people lot of people who didn't know, and then they just have just found out recently, so. Recently? Yeah, wow. Yeah, since I started to, um, you know, they, you Google me now, and it's, it's out there. Um, mm -hmm. You see me on Chronicle, you, you know, I'm, I have to be on Facebook, you know, I'm not a big social media person, but I'm trying, mm -hmm. uh, so I have to be out there, and, and people are, you know, surprised. Mm -hmm. I think we, uh, <laughs> you know... 
I have younger cousins and I see the struggles that they have going to private schools, going to college. Yeah. They, it's, you, you look at people, the way they dress, the way they speak, the way they handle their clients and so mm -hmm. forth and so on. It's a sea of sameness, mm -hmm. right? We all, to a certain degree, I look back and I certainly have my years of trying to be the same. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden I'm here, you know, in this, I was walking down the street with my mom. She's like, uh, these foreigners. I'm like, no, 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 mom. They're not foreigners. You are the foreigner here on the street. You are the different one. Right. And like, it's so interesting. You don't, you know, in China, I, I remember I have so many personal stories to share with you. Cause I, I just been, since we started the conversation in June, I've been thinking, uh, like thinking of you this whole time. And it's it just a magical moment because especially after listening to the podcast, mm -hmm. I think about growing up. So I'm 32. I've, mm -hmm. um, I'm sort of the first generation when the one child policy was institutionalized and oh, wow. um, started. So people always ask me, right? If you're Chinese living in America, people want to ask you two questions. One of which is, you know, what is it like to be a girl? Mm -hmm. And how did your parents treat you differently? So forth and so on. And so I start thinking about this quite a bit and kind of in parallel uh, mm -hmm. to your story as well that, um, for the longest time, you know, I wanted to be a boy, but yeah. for a different reason. For a different reason, yeah. You know, I just didn't, I had a lot of boy cousins, and even until this day, a very close friend of mine said, you know, Faye, your dad was, um, uh, you know, was general in the army, and I'm revealing that for the first time now. Wow. And what is it like for him to have an only daughter? Like, did, what was his struggle? I'm like, what? What do you mean? He didn't struggle. He loved having me. <laughs> This guy's like, yeah, right. I started to break it. I'm like, uh, and then at the age of 30, I was just like, felt like, what, you know, what's going on? I stopped thinking about this for yeah. a very long time. Yeah. And um, so that's why I've just so, like, so look forward to speaking with you. Yeah, that's crazy. I mean, but you always felt loved. Yes. I, I did. I mm -hmm. did. I, but you know what's interesting as a child, and which I think your childhood story is something mm -hmm. I definitely want to delve into. Mm -hmm is as a child, there's something that we've been told and there's something that we feel deeply. Mm -hmm. And um, I've, in China, unfortunately, your parents don't always tell you that they love you. Yes. Well, <laughs> well, you know, we never said I love you in our house. Yeah. I wow. always knew I was loved and I knew they loved me. And, you know, they'd sign cards, love mom, love mm -hmm. dad, and we did the same. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was their generation. Mm -hmm. and Because my friends say the same thing. And it wasn't until I came back from college and my older sister came back. It was really my older sister started it. She came back from college mm. and she started to say, you know, I love you. And, and I, you know, I was only a year behind her, so I was in college and we kind of started it and kind of guilted them into saying it back, you know what I mean? <laughs> but then, they, then we started to say it all the time. Yeah. But I think it was awkward for them because their parents probably never said it to them. Mm -hmm. I think it was a, a generational thing. But I always felt loved. There was no question. Um, but I just remember being so scared to tell them, even knowing that they loved me, I just, I was like, do they love me enough? Mm -hmm. Deal with this and let me be who I am and not be ashamed and deal with the ramifications of me going public with this because, you know, I felt like I would embarrass and humiliate them. And, you know, I knew they loved me as, as their child and did they love, as their daughter, did they love me enough as their son? You know, what, what was that going to be like? And that was the nervousness. Mm -hmm. And I just didn't know. And... Looking back on it now, I can't believe I ever questioned mm -hmm. questioned that. I mean, it's it it really um, you know I get emotional thinking about it. How could I have ever thought that of them? Mm -hmm. And just the way that they've supported me and handled this has been just amazing. Mm -hmm. And I would not be here today if, if they if I didn't have their love and support. And it's unfortunate because most kids who are transgender do not have that mm. and it's you know a big part of the reason why the suicide attempt rate is so high yeah i i was very heartbroken uh learning that as well and um 
you know, I think that really transitions in, into the question that mm-hmm. I wanted to ask. And after listening yeah. to your other podcast, like, why hasn't that question been asked? And after speaking with Anna Ruth, she's like, well, like, he was able to answer that during the 3% conference, mm-hmm. which is why now? Because, you know, listening to your story, I realized that's a part, that's a part of your history. You know, mm-hmm. you wanted to kind of leave behind. You have a new identity now. This is mm-hmm. who you are. Mm-hmm. Uh, and all of a sudden, two years ago, you've, you know, basically, you came out and started sharing this story mm-hmm. uh, with the public. And you talk yeah. about the struggles. Like, why Why now? Uh, well, so... I- I, I'd always. I'm a, there are a couple reasons, and uh, one of the reasons is I've always been uh, a person who believes that things happen for a reason. I don't know. It gives me, mm-hmm. gives me. Uh, you know, I believe in God, and I, I believe things happen for a reason. There's a higher power, and you know, I got to say, being transgender is a nightmare. It it is the worst. I would never wish it on my worst enemy. It just sucks. And it is it is horrible thing to to go through, and I always wondered why me, why I'm a I'm a good person, I'm nice to people, I treat everybody with respect. I, you know, I I'm just I, I'm not an evil person. Why would God make me this way? I just don't understand. And I've been struggling to you know my whole transition, my whole life, basically. Why? And I started to think about, well, there's a, there's a couple things in play. You know, my, I have a loving and supportive family. I have uh, parents who have the resources financially to afford the surgeries that I would need. Back then, nothing was covered. Um, and I'm a, a very stubborn and strong-willed person. Um, and I am, when I know something that I want and something that needs to happen, I make it happen. And so, you know, I knew I was going to see this through. And then the other thing is, I'm a writer and I'm articulate. I'm a, I can present. And that's just because of how, what my job was. Mm-hmm. And when you put all these things together, um, if God had to stick it to somebody, I was a pretty good target because my odds of being successful were very high. Mm-hmm. And being a writer and somebody who who can present and, and speak about it articulately uh, and in just a, a regular conversational way, mm-hmm. um, I think that was sort of maybe why. Maybe that was my reason and that's what I was supposed to do, write about it and talk to people about it, and, and help change perceptions. So that was a big reason, and that's sort of what I was thinking about as I decided, you know what, i got to write. I've got to write this book, and if I don't do it now, I'm never going to do it. And I tried to do it while I was at Arnold working, and I, I, just, I was working 70-hour weeks, you know. And, mm-hmm. and I, I, they were kind enough to let me try to do it part-time, so I was working four days a week, and then I was going to do the fifth day writing, mm-hmm. and that just blew up in my face. So there, there was, <laughs> that was never going to happen. Um, mm-hmm. So I, I had been here a long time, and I was getting kind of burnt out anyway. And, and I was like, you know what? I just got to do it. Mm-hmm. I got to do this now, or mm-hmm. I'm never going to do it. Um, and at that time, um, I don't know if you remember this. Uh, for people in Massachusetts, they might remember this. But all over the news was uh, Michelle Kosalik, who was um, in prison for murder. Mm-hmm. Uh, and she was uh, a male to female, and she was all over the news because she was going to have gender reassignment, and all the taxpayers were going to have to pay for the surgery. Do you remember that? I remember, yeah. It was all over the news, Mm -hmm. and they were showing images of her that were not the least bit flattering, and again, and this murderer, you know, murderer, murderer, transgender murderer, you know, the pictures of, of her, and it was all, that's all what was in the news and what the media was showing, and it just, you know, I was, you know, already, this is what the media does, and I was like, God, you know, can't they just show mm-hmm. people who are, quote, normal, yeah. who live everyday lives, are successful in what their career is, and, 
-hmm. If you walk down the street, you'd never know in a million years, you know. Mm -hmm. That's more the reality. Um, but that's not what you see. And then it's a Caitlyn Jenner story as well. I mean, yeah, that's well, the that, extreme that of Hollywood. Came, yeah, that, that, that came later. But so that was when, that was three years ago when I started to, I was like, God, you know, I really need to change mm -hmm. the face of this and, yeah. and, and try to change perceptions. And then the third reason was I learned about this suicide attempt rate is 50% for kids before they turn 20. 50% of all transgender kids will try to kill themselves. And, you know, my belief is that it's because they don't have any hope. They're not getting support mm -hmm. uh, at home. And, you know, when I went through this, my parents didn't have any success stories to turn to. There was nothing. They couldn't look at someone who went through this and be like, okay, well, look at this person. Mm -hmm. You know, Chris could turn out like them. And yeah. that would be fine. Yeah. That would be great. Mm -hmm. And I feel that if there are more people like me who share their story, parents will have that, kids will have that, mm -hmm. and they'll they'll see that there is hope. Mm -hmm. And if a parent sees their child could turn out, you know, I'm not saying, oh, ooh, you got you, everyone wants to turn out like me. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying, you know, this didn't define me. You know, I had a, a very successful career as a creative director, lots of friends you know, dating, all of that. You can live a full and happy life, and this doesn't have to define you unless you want it to. Um, then maybe parents, when a kid comes out to them, the parent would be more supportive, the kids would have support, and maybe the suicide rate would drop. Mm -hmm. So that's a long-winded way of saying why now, but, uh, you know, as I did tell you, I was struggling with it because I had put it behind me. It was in my history. I was living my life as a man, the way I was meant to be. And mm -hmm. this is why you don't see mm -hmm. many stories like mine out mm -hmm. there. I, I see your action, uh, you know, rather differently than what you had just described mm. a few minutes ago. Because what I see is bravery, you yeah. know. Thank you. And it's like, you know, you, you've had a, a lot of things happen. And, you know, nobody could, I, I, could, I couldn't possibly tell you know, or even imagine you, you know, you were mm -hmm. ever a woman. Like, yeah. it just never even occurred to me. But yet, you're coming out, and you almost become a target, right? You become an icon, in a sense. And you become a target to people who are, you know, freaking out because, you know, I, I find myself speaking about growth versus fixed mindset mm -hmm. a lot lately. Mm -hmm. And so, credit you know, um, to the woman who hopefully I'll have on my podcast in, in the new year. I already mm -hmm. reached out to her. And, you know, I personally, I find it very difficult to say that. Why are you, if anybody's struggling with this, like, why are you struggling to believe that there are other people different than you are? Mm -hmm. I don't okay. understand why you're struggling, you know. And why um, do you think that is? Other well, than I think, I think anything that's different... <laughs> Or anything that challenges the status quo or the way things are or challenge beliefs, mm. uh, it's easier for people to react that way than to change their own beliefs. Mm -hmm. And that's that's the fallback. I mean, I don't know if you heard Ben Carson, his comment, um, after the Houston, the public accommodations bills that are, that there's one in Boston that uh, we're hoping will pass. Um, and this is, this is to um, give transgender people rights uh, not to be discriminated discriminated against in public areas mm -hmm. and and what is happening is they're reducing it to the bathroom bill that's what they're calling it mm -hmm. because the reason it's getting shot down in cities and states all over the country is there uh, there are groups that are instilling fear that if this bill passes then and it's mostly transgender women so male mm -hmm. to female yeah uh, they will follow your young daughters into public uh, restrooms uh. and molest them. And that's that's the fear that they're instilling right. in mm -hmm. people, these groups. Right. So Ben Carson was asked about the one in Houston that did not pass. And he said, you know, he was basically like, well, why don't we just give, no, why don't we just give transgenders their own bathrooms? You know, and he's basically saying separate. Yeah. He's like, why should I, he said, something to the effect of why should I have to change? Mm -hmm. Why should we all be made to feel uncomfortable? You know, and you know, my first thought was, oh, okay, well, should we go back to the Jim Crow laws? You know, mm -hmm. when, um, you know, 
white people did that to black people and mm -hmm. and there were coloreds only bathrooms mm -hmm. that that black people had to use that's pretty much what he's saying mm -hmm. um so people would rather react mm -hmm. that way than change their own beliefs it's harder to open your mind and listen and accept other people mm -hmm. it's just easier to just you know, yeah and turn your back on it and think that they're freaks and just not deal with it, not mm -hmm. accept it. And yet you, you've you joined, uh, I feel like you've joined a movement. Actually, I think you more, instead of joining, you started your own movement and you initiated it. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, I get, I get, <laughs> I get, I, I get hesitant when, when the talk of movements and activists and all of mm -hmm. that because I'm not an I'm not an activist and I never want to be mm -hmm. and I never want to speak for an entire community I, I never do that mm -hmm. um, my hope is that by sharing my own personal story it can help people understand better uh, what it's like and that it isn't a choice mm -hmm. and that you know no one would ever choose this path it's a nightmare you would never choose it uh, unless you were had no other choice, so um, it is you're born that way, mm -hmm. and you know at a very early age, for the most part, I knew it four or five, um, and that's all I claim to do. I just I'll tell you my story and hope that people learn from it. Um, every just like no one gay person can mm -hmm. speak for the whole gay community. Mm -hmm. No one straight person can, or cis person, they call non-transgender people are cis. Mm -hmm. No one cis person can speak for the entire community. So there are lots of voices to be heard, and, and mine is just one, one of, of them. them you know? and, and I find that as I was doing uh, some research uh, for our topics, and uh, obviously some of my listeners challenge me, like, are you ready, are you knowledgeable enough to even conduct the interview? <laughs> Right. So, and I realized, you know what, there's an opportunity on the table here for mm -hmm. me is to learn more. And um, I've had ex experience and, you know, mm -hmm. um, friends with um, people who are transgender. Mm -hmm. And because of that, I, I feel very appreciative of that experience because, you know, I think there are, unfortunately, it would be great if we just self or self starters, but sometimes we are, we need to be triggered to think differently. Right. Um, to learn more, and I find more stories for transgender women than transgender men. Yeah. Um, do you think statistically it, it is it is the case, or is that an? I I think it's probably even. Um, you know, true. but it looks that people say that to me uh, mm. all the time. That I think because um, there's a saying. Mm -hmm. There's a saying that. Uh, Let's see if I get it right. Um, for trans, uh, for transgender women, it's easier to pass in the in the sheets, but with trans men, it's easier to pass on the streets. Mm -hmm. And what that means is the surgery for male to female is much easier than surgery. For female to male, mm -hmm. it's it's harder to add than it is to subtract. Mm -hmm. So, um, more, and it's less expensive too. So more male to females are having surgeries, mm -hmm. and because it's you know less expensive and it's an easier procedure, and there have been more of them done, mm -hmm. it's more um, established that mm -hmm. that procedure for. Um, female to male less are having the surgeries and it, because it's easier to pass mm -hmm. you know I have I have air quotes going mm -hmm. to pass mm -hmm. on the streets you might not know mm -hmm. but if 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 um, there are trans women who have transitioned later in life it's a lot um, it's a lot harder to pass mm -hmm. uh, and that's why this whole Caitlyn Jenner thing there's a lot of backlash because she's had so many feminization procedures yeah. on her face. She was older when this happened. Yes, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of... So when I say the surgery for for male to female is easier, I'm talking about the genital yeah. surgery. Um, there are lots of other procedures that, like Caitlin did, to make herself look more 
feminine and, mm. and demasculize Facial. her face. And what what other trans women are saying who can't afford those procedures and maybe don't even want to go through them. It's painful and it's it's a scary thing. Mm. But they're saying that it's creating a um, beauty standard now mm. that you have to fit into. I see. And so it's it's hard. You know, it's like why can't people just look how they look and, and be accepted? But what what they're saying is now, you know, with Caitlin and, and other mm. trans people who look like you'd never know in a million years and they've had these procedures, that's mm. now the ideal standard that all trans people have to have to get to. That I never thought about that yeah. before and there are um, models now that Andrea mm-hmm. Japajic, uh, Gina Rocaro. Mm-hmm. I mean, they are beautiful women, and you know they're trans women. They're beautiful women, and um, you know when you start transitioning earlier, mm-hmm. during you know ideally you would start before puberty, and then you'd never have the puberty of the gender that you are not. Mm-hmm. You know you wouldn't have that physical puberty. Um, they're doing that now. They have hormone blockers that can make that happen. And then, so for me, you know, if I had had that, I would have been taller. I would never have had breasts to have to remove them. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like you, there are certain things you're still going to have to take care of surgically if you choose to. Mm-hmm. But you, you bit your build and your, you know, for, for, for boys who, who are going to transition to female, they wouldn't have an Adam's apple. They wouldn't build the muscular skeletal uh, of a man. So there's a lot of, of differences, and that's why, you know, there's a controversy now. The doctors are saying trans uh, kids should be starting this now to give themselves a better outcome. outcome. Yeah. And uh, other people are saying they're too young to know, and, how, you know, how do you know, and mm-hmm. are they, do, do, can they... Um, do they have the emotional strength strength so to do to do yeah. it at that age? You know, like I, I don't. Those are that good I questions. Can't answer those questions. It's up to every person individually. And I, uh, yeah, those are I think really interesting explorations because in order for the transition to happen, you do need a support network, meaning the doctors, you know, maybe the one eight hundred number to call, mm-hmm. and then also just. Just meetups, just gr- groups of people you can relate to. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm talking too. Like, you know, yes, I would have preferred that because I could have, you know, yeah, I could have been taller. You know, I could have had, you know, a mm-hmm. body that seemed more masculine, and I could, and I wouldn't have had to undergo uh, the same surgeries that I've had. But um, would I have? Been, I mean, back then, at my age, you know, back then, forget it. Like, no one would have accepted it. I would have been. I don't know what my life would have turned out like. Mm-hmm. And now I look at kids, and kids seem to be so much more accepting of differences. But I'm, they're still bullying. Mm-hmm. So if you were to go through that, you know, at that age, I don't know. Mm-hmm. I don't know what it would be like. And, you know, how how my childhood would have been, you know, if I was bullied and ostracized and, and that. But, you know, I look at my nieces uh, at their age, you know, they're, they're now 12 and... Uh, Ten, mm-hmm. and when I told them, mm. they were, um, I think they were, they were nine and yeah, it was. I think they were ten and eight. Wow, what was that like? How old they were, and they had no idea, mm. and so they knew me as their uncle Steiny, and I was their time. uncle, and they didn't know. Yeah, how do they react? How do they respond to that? They, um, they were. We were playing cards. Yeah, and they were beating me as usual uh and we had a break and, and hannah and my sister wendy um, we had decided we were going to tell them you know with this book coming out and they were very curious what my book was about and they're old enough to know yeah, as well yeah and uh and so um you know i i told them my sister brought up the book on purpose and then i said yeah well hopefully publishers are looking at it now and then Hopefully one of them will want to buy it, and then, you know, you guys can read it, you know. Mm-hmm. And I said, do you know what it's about? And and they said, oh, yeah. Um, Cal, the older one, she's like, yeah, it's a, um, it's a memoir. She knows the term memoir because mm-hmm. I've, ta- I've told her. 
and I said, do you, you know, do you know the difference between a biography and a memoir? And I told her, a biography is a person's whole life, and a memoir is, so, is a specific piece of it. Got it. And it could relate to something traumatic mm -hmm. or something, ha you know, just, mm -hmm. and, and, and I said, you know, you don't know this, but, you know, I went through something very traumatic, and, and um, it took a lot. Mm -hmm. It was a big struggle, and it was hard for me, and, and I'm writing about it to help other people who might have to go through it. And so, you know, they were kind of looking at me worried, like, oh, my God, you know, what was it? And, mm -hmm. and uh, I just, mm -hmm. it was so hard. I was so nervous, but I, I just said, um, you know, when I was born, I was born with a girl's body. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to say I was born a girl. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to be clear that yeah. it was, it was... I was always a boy to me, mm -hmm. and it was just this body. And they, you know, they were very surprised. I mean, they, their eyes, like, widened. Mm -hmm. And I just talked about how I didn't understand um, why everyone thought I was a girl and why did I have this body when I knew I was a boy. And, t you know, told them a little bit about it, and, but spoke in very plain terms, very mm -hmm. simple, mm -hmm. very, very simple. Um, and so we had a long conversation about it. They didn't ask any questions, which I thought they would. Mm -hmm. uh, and they just kind of like sat there and nodded. And I said, well, are you surprised? And they're like, yeah. <laughs> you know, I, and I said, do you have any questions you want to ask me? Or, you know, you might not have any now, but any time. Mm. They didn't have any questions. And then, you know, then Wendy said to me, why didn't they ask him? I thought for sure. I'm like, I don't know, they'll probably ask you, not me. Mm -hmm. So that night she put them to bed, she came down. They didn't ask me any questions. Oh, no. The next day, they didn't ask any questions. Mm. Uh, and we were at the beach uh, the next day, and, mm -hmm. you know, I didn't have a shirt on, and I'm standing there, and mm -hmm. I did catch Ava taking a closer look at my chest than she maybe normally would have, and I <laughs> caught her, and she looked away real quick. <laughs> And then the next day, Calla said to me, um, or Wendy said to me, Calla has a question for you. And I said, oh, okay, you know, what is it, Calla? And she goes, am I going to be in the book? You know, that was her one question. That's awesome. And then, and then three weeks later, Wendy called me, and she's like, so, Stein, i got to tell you the story. You know, it's been three weeks. They have not brought it up, have not asked us one thing. So Mike and I are sitting at the table with the girls, and, She's like, finally, I brought it up. I couldn't take it. And I'm like, so guys, Uncle Steiny's news. Do you know? Do you want to talk about it? Do you have any questions? You know? And Ava, the younger one, she goes, rolls her eyes, and she goes, oh, we get it, Mom. You yeah. know what I mean? And they yeah. had seen it on TV. They saw uh, oh. an episode of The Boss. What's that? The Undercover Boss? Yeah, yeah. There was an episode with a transgender employee, and they had seen it. They knew. They knew. That's not a big deal. They don't care. It's almost like breaking, breaking out, like, yeah. what sex is. The parents are like, let's seat you down. Like, yeah. It, the kids are like, that's not necessary. So they yeah. were they were amazing, and it's not. And I was worried our relationship was going to change, and it really has not changed one bit. Mm. I, I'm not surprised about the ending, but I'm so glad you share that story because, you know, for, for the person who needs to initiate a conversation, I can just imagine yeah. just the amount of um, sort of the dynamics and the emotions that, that go through. Not easy. Yeah. But when I was listening to Dear Sugar the other day about um, was, you know, one of the brothers is gay and he was bringing his partner to the party and the parents were really worried uh, like how the kids are going to react. And that was a whole conversation. Right. The parents even wrote a story to Dear Sugar. And and basically Dear Sugar is like, first of all, what is wrong with, with adults? <laughs> like they're, the kids are not even computing. Right. They're not relating in that way. Right. And it's because it's us. Right. You know, we're putting all that all those filters. Yeah. And that's why I think the sooner kids know before they have those, pre you know, before adults instill those prejudices mm -hmm. or or opinions on them mm -hmm. you know they're so pure at that age they just they are accepting of differences and their generation is going to be the one that eradicates the prejudice yeah yeah who knows maybe yeah. I, I have a feeling there's so many the, the past hundred years especially the past 50 years mm. 
Uh, so interesting. I'm so intrigued by. I'm not really a student of history, or I'm not necessarily good at it. It's a subject I was just frowned upon. I was like, uh, in China, too many, too many years of history, you know. And、um, but I find it to be so fascinating to witness, you know, the simple phenomenon of, of people wanted to keep a job for the rest of their entire life, you know. And versus now, like. We're all trying to do something different.、Mm-hmm. We're doing podcasting. We're writing a book,、mm-hmm. and that imagine doing that even twenty, thirty years ago, people think that you're crazy.、Mm-hmm. Uh, like you're setting up the, the that's not a good example for people to learn from you. I mean,、um, so, but things are changing now, and I, you know, I, I feel the same way of to a certain degree coming to America、uh, when I was sixteen. Uh, in the year of 2000, there are a lot of people before me, but there weren't as many high school students、mm-hmm. coming, you know, to the U.S.、Mm-hmm. all by themselves. So,、uh, to a certain degree, I felt the responsibility to to do a number of things. If、mm-hmm. if I may just kind of lay them out, one is that at a young age you can still establish yourself.、Mm-hmm. You, you can work hard. You can, in my case, there are people watching me to fail because I had a really good life in China. My My parents were very established, and you know they have a network of people who would just hire me after college. I don't know what they were thinking, but then also secondly, I feel like there was that pre preconception and misconception about Chinese people in the U.S. Right? One, your English is difficult to to be. You know, you're just impossible to be understood. For one. And you do certain things, you eat certain food, you behave a certain way, you only hang out with certain types of people. I mean, those were all true. And one of my most pleasant surprises, as I received this a card upon graduation from my physics teacher,、mm-hmm. and he wrote down, and he was an amazing man, and he wrote down, "It's like you changed my perception about Chinese people,、oh, yeah. you know."、Yeah. And I thought that was so powerful.、Mm-hmm. And thirdly, kind of just like hit it home.、Nice. <laughs> Was the fact that you know Chinese people are physically sort of weak, and that you're nerds, right? You read books, you're good at math, but you can't do sports. So、uh, I,、uh, so I,、uh, out of all the sports I could have chosen,、um, I was a really, I loved playing ice hockey、oh、in Beijing,、yeah. and a little did I know that coming. I was just telling my friend,、uh, coworkers downstairs the other day that I was so good at two things in China: speaking English and playing <laughs> hockey. <laughs> the moment I arrived in this country, I selected both of them.、Yeah. Right? I was like the worst at both of them, and especially going up to school in Maine. Oh yeah, yeah. people specialize in、yeah. ice hockey. Daddies、yeah. build rinks when they're right, two and a half. Right, right.、Yeah. And as、so、I did that, and then there were people、um, in Maine playing hockey in Maine. I walk into the it's so, it's so funny. I walk into the, the ice rink. People look at me. It's like I only see you people on TV. There are kids who told me that they only saw people like me on TV,、oh、and it's、God. really interesting to see me in, in person. Wow! And then after a little while,、uh, and then we didn't have a girls' team, so I was playing with the boys. And then I saw, and I wish my parents were there, you know, to kind of because I was scared too.、Mm-hmm. Uh, I wasn't the the best on the team, but I needed to do that. I just needed to do that,、mm-hmm. you know. And and then there were people from the school. My teacher will all come watch me play, so. And I think it will take time, and I think it takes courage, and really just that determination. So, again, in a parallel story,、yeah. I'm fully supportive of what you're doing, and I hope you keep going. Yeah, you know what you said about when that person came up to you and said, "You changed your teacher. You changed my perception." You know, I、mm-hmm. I've done a f- few of these speaking engagements, and it is so gratifying to、mm-hmm. me. I love you know I love doing them. And I love、um, the best part is you get off the stage and people come up to you afterward and say say those things to you and they they wait to talk to you. I I, I couldn't make it to the bathroom after one of them. <laughs> I've been holding it the whole time I was up there and I couldn't get to the bathroom for two hours. Yeah.、Uh, because so many people just wanted to say to me what what you said makes me understand better. Mm-hmm. Uh, one woman came up to me, and she she was the first one to grab me, and she said, "I, you changed my perception completely."、Yeah. And I said, "Oh, great!" And <laughs> she said, "You know, my son is in high school, and his best friend is transgender, and just flaunts it all over the place, and you know, comes over to the house with these 
the fingernail, the painted nails, and the clothes, and the, you know, the voice, and, you know, when I see him, mm -hmm. I have to leave the room. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, okay, you know, what? Mm -hmm. And she said, but after hearing your talk, I am ashamed of myself. Wow. And the next time he comes to the house, I'm going to give him a big hug. And I said, well, call him or her when yeah. you do that, you know? But, yeah, yeah. But, I mean, just hearing that, okay, I changed one, there's one person, you know, and if I can just keep, if, if my story can help people understand and, and get them to be more accepting, then that's great. And it just affirms that I'm doing the right thing and that by writing this book, it is going to help. Because sometimes, you know, when you're, mm -hmm. you write the book and yeah, it's your own story and yeah, you think it's interesting, but what are, <laughs> do other people think it's interesting? I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, and the first speaking engagement I did for the ad club here to seven over 700 people, that moment for me uh, confirmed that I was doing the right thing. I, I wasn't among the audience, which I regretted big time, but I spoke with someone who was there, and she absolutely loved it. Mm -hmm. She loved your speech the same person and my friends from other agencies who went to the three percent conference oh, yeah. and yeah. told me your speech was hands I mentioned your name. <laughs> I mean, there are many names that I could throw around mm -hmm. and this uh, this woman a new she's from India and she said that was hands down the most incredible experience. Yeah. That's nice to hear. Wow. It was amazing because I had that time I actually had dinner with her just uh, last last Friday, I believe, and I had not seen her mm -hmm. for a year. Mm -hmm. I was very jealous of her <laughs> being able to go to a three percent conference oh and she went and she came back, yeah. she shared this, and I said, "But hold on so i <laughs> I pulled on my cell phone and i share i I showed her your email oh, she's like, funny. "No way, that's and people." Funny. I real I emailed you and I like I had this like kind of weird feeling as I was on the train because we had only exchanged emails a couple of times and and every time I write to you you, re you responded you responded right away wholeheartedly you you know you, you know mm -hmm. emails I mean I know you're a writer so maybe I'm, I'm not saying this to other people who aren't but uh, it just very very emotional and very very authentic. <laughs> And I was so I was on the train. I read your message. You're like, Faye, I will, you know, the book. But how how could we make the podcast better mm -hmm. and and all that? And I was so touched by it. So I had to tell you. I think it would probably surprise you. I was like, who is this person? I've not even met her yet. <laughs> so I think if you ever question how you come across, I think it, that message and that feeling is universal. That if I were, you know, to choose anybody, I would choose you. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Well, that's good to hear. You know, the, I try to keep. That's my goal, you know, when I'm speaking or when I'm writing, mm -hmm. that that I be the same person, you know, I'm not, when I'm on stage, I'm still me, when I'm talking to you, I'm still me, and when I'm, when I'm blogging or, or writing the book, I'm, I try to keep that voice, because that's my voice, you know, mm -hmm. I can't, can't change the voice, and um, part of the thing with the book is that you know, I had some readers read it. You know, you have a group of readers after you write something that just sort of mm -hmm. read it through and give you some thoughts. And all of them said to me, it sounded like it was you sitting next to me mm -hmm. telling you. When, I re when they read it, it sounded like it was me talking to them. Which, to me, then meant, okay, mm -hmm. then I'm doing what I want to do. Now, do publishers uh, find that as appealing? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Because... Mm. Uh, you know, my writing is not heady, it is not uh, flowery mm -hmm. or intellectual. You know, I'm an mm -hmm. ad guy. I write I write like I speak and, and I write like I write commercials and, you know, my goal is to, w whether I'm speaking or, or with the book, is to, you know, in advertising we, we engage and we entertain mm -hmm. and then we slip in the education things like what we want them to know about a product or what we want them to learn, mm -hmm. uh, we slip that in there in mm -hmm. the middle. Mm -hmm. And the goal is that they're entertained and engaged by the commercial or the, whatever the piece of advertising is, that then they will learn. Mm -hmm. um, if you just start throwing facts at people, they're not going to pay attention to it. So that's sort of how I, you know, that's the important thing. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a big difference between 
somebody teaching you about transgender issues and teaching you the terminology and teaching you what to say and what not to say versus hearing somebody's story. Mm -hmm. Very big difference. I would love to see you self-publish your book. Um, well, I'll be making a decision soon. Uh, yeah. And I've, I've already, um, if the self-publishing happens, uh, it will happen. But I also have an offer from a publisher I'm, mm -hmm. I'm considering now, and I will be still waiting to hear from others. But um, by the end of this month, I hope, uh, uh, I will have all the information in. And, and uh, if I go with the offer I have now on the table, the book will be out uh, in July. Oh, wow. It in takes July. a while to do, to do it. Yeah. Uh, but they have a process they go through. Of course, they have editors. You know, they... right. And self-publishing, mm -hmm. if I, I could just put it on Amazon, that's one, that's one way to do it. But mm -hmm. that, I really wanted a distribution network. Yeah. Uh, so, I don't know. I'm still weighing all the options right now. But I have to make a decision because I am not a patient person. And this has been a very long Journey. process for me. It's been a long process. And I was not expecting it to, um, you know take this long yeah well well yeah i know it's, it's totally for a different podcast but i'm so yeah. glad i i brought up james heltacher who yes. yeah who's gonna be <laughs> he's someone i'm confirming to podcast with me as well that's great yeah and then i gotta uh, text him actually oh yeah yeah i'm going to now please do I have the four digits yeah for, <laughs> <laughs> what kind of producer is me sending a nine digit phone number <laughs> That was pretty funny. Uh, he's he's had oh I also want to mention that James has a Thursday afternoon I think three p.m. Eastern Standard Time a Twitter chat so he's actively responding. Oh, he to, responds. Oh, that's great. Yeah, so I will send you yes, the information. Yes, for sure. Um, but before I feel like we haven't even gotten to all your other questions. I know. What are some of the? <laughs> I don't know. I always feel this way. I always prepare. Yeah. And then, but I almost never look at the questions again yeah. because you've taken me to so many. Well, we knew that would happen. Yeah. You just kind of go around. Yeah. Um, well, one of the questions I think maybe you have already gotten there. We'll double check. Uh, one of my favorite questions is, what are some of the questions that you wish people would ask you? but haven't yet, you know, I feel like some of the question may be more generic, but, um, that I wish people would ask. Me. Um, it's funny. People ask me questions all the time. Mm -hmm. So I've been asked pretty much everything. <laughs> um, what, what I do find is, you know, people often say a big, a big question is what, what are you not supposed to say to somebody? Yeah. You know, what, I think the worry is, what should I not be saying to yeah. someone who's transgender? You know, that, that seems to be a popular... Let's clarify that. Um, yeah, that wanna... seems to be a popular one. And I think that most people know, at least I hope they know by now, that you should not ask if they've had or plan to have surgery. Yep. Um, and I explained this at the 3% conference. And... I make a point to explain it because people say it, but they never explain why you shouldn't ask. Mm -hmm. um, it's an invasive question, so it's none of your business. That seems to be the face value of it, yeah. but it's offensive. It's an offensive question, and the reason it's an offensive question is because by asking someone who's transgender if they've had surgery or plan to have surgery, what you're implying to them is they're not the gender they affirm they are unless mm -hmm. they have surgery to alter themselves. Yeah. And many transgender people never have surgery mm -hmm. for a number of reasons. You you can never know what what someone's what's going on in their head or what their reasons are and there are plenty, believe me, mm -hmm. why you wouldn't. Mm -hmm. Um so by saying that it, you're implying that well, it's not legit until you have the surgery and change mm -hmm. your body to match. That's not true, yeah. And that's, that's not true. Mm -hmm. um, I, I also clarify that, you know, there's a difference between being offensive and being unintentionally hurtful. And I get, it takes a lot to offend me. And um, there, was, there was one incident, which I'll tell you about, which mm -hmm. was very offensive. Um, I was at a lecture, and this was a uh, well-educated 
best-selling author who was doing a, uh, a seminar on self-publishing. And it was a small group that ended up showing up, and this was in Cambridge, by the way. So you'd think people would be, and he lives in Cambridge, mm -hmm. so you'd think forward-thinking, mm -hmm. progressive mm -hmm. person. And he asked everyone to go around and say, why are, why are you, what are you hoping to get out of this? You know, wh what's your situation? So it got to me, and I said, I've written a memoir. Mm -hmm. uh, it's called Balls. Mm -hmm. And I said, what it, you know, it was about my transition um, from female to male, and, and I'm, I'm trying to determine, you know, what route I should go. And his face, and I, I was like, okay, because I, I, you know, you may look at me and never think in a million years, and that's sort of mm -hmm. what his attitude was, and his response in front of the group to me was, um, wow, you know, you look very convincing. Mm -hmm. um, you could even use a shave. And so that's offensive because, you know, if someone says, wow, you pass really well, a lot of people get offended by that even. Mm -hmm. I don't, but mm -hmm. a lot of people do. But when someone says, you look convincing, mm -hmm. that is an overt way of saying you're trying to fool people. Mm -hmm. You know, you're really not, but you're trying to, you're, you're, you got a good act going on. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that, that to me was offensive because it was so overt and it was in it's front of public, people all you don't, these people. Didn't know, yeah. And then he um, kept making jokes about it mm, throughout. It was awkward. The, the next, the, the woman sitting next to me, it was her turn and she she said, he said, okay, and what's your name? And she said her name, and he goes, and have you always been a woman? You know, it was like one thing after another with this guy, and I almost walked out. And then finally oh. I'm like, you know what, I need to see how far is he really going to go with this. Yeah. And he took it for the whole hour. <laughs> oh, my God. The whole hour. And oh. then I left, and then his email address was in one of the things he gave us. Yeah. And I sent him a very long email and made it a teachable moment for him. Did he respond? Uh, he did respond, mm -hmm. and I said, I, you know, I, I laid out every comment he made and why it was offensive, and mm -hmm. and that he was very lucky it was me sitting there and not somebody else um, who might have punched him in the face, mm -hmm. or, you know, blasted him mm -hmm. online, and really humiliated him. Mm -hmm. I blogged about it on the Huffington Post, but I didn't use his name or anything like that. Someone mm -hmm. else might have just done it. Yeah. Um, and he apologized right away and he said I'd like to call you mm -hmm. if, if I may and, and apologize to you in person and I said that's not necessary but mm -hmm. you know I appreciate it I accept your apology so that to me is offensive mm -hmm. then there's um, people who are just they don't they're trying to compliment you they're struggling they don't know uh, what to say and yeah. they're and you know that they're not trying to be offensive and they're not trying to be hurtful but things they say can be hurtful and, and the thing I say that that hurts me the most is if somebody says to me what did your name used to be mm -hmm. and that might seem innocuous and when I tell someone that they're like really mm -hmm. that is offensive and I said it isn't offensive it's hurtful mm -hmm. because what you're doing is bringing me back to a time in my life Mm -hmm. where I want, I was ready to kill myself. Like, why would you want to send me back to a horrible time and place? Mm -hmm. And, like, if, if people say, oh, I, I can't, I can't picture you in a dress. I can't, did you go to your prom? Like, did you wear a prom dress? Like, things like that are, you're putting me there. Why are you putting me there? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And I think they think they're complimenting me by saying they could never picture it in a million years looking at me. Mm -hmm. But um, it is hurtful. And you never want to m make someone who's transgender, force them to go back to that time when they were that other self that they hated. Mm -hmm. So I think people don't understand the difference. And that is a, that is a big difference. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of information that I'm processing right yeah. now yeah no it's absolutely true and and i i want to sort of apologize on behalf of a uh, um chinese people because we always struggle with pronouns 
Because oh, in pronouns, Chinese, yeah. I want to kind of just give yeah. you a heads up. Like, pronouns are a big thing. Definitely, it's huge. And then we, the reason for me to say that is nearly everybody I've worked with, interacted with, because in Chinese, it, the, there's no differentiation in terms of the, uh, not in the written form, they're different. Oh, but the way you really? say them is the same. Oh, wow. Personally, yeah. I caught myself in the first couple of years since I I gotten here. That's one mistake. I just, I really have to think. Yeah. You know, like, yep. before... Well, yeah. it, it is hard. It's yeah. hard for people. And I understand that. And, yeah. you know, when I was going through this, mm -hmm. uh, my therapist was like, listen, you have to be on people. Yeah. You can't keep letting it slip. Yeah. Because the more you let it slip, the longer it's going to take yeah. for people to, they need to know you're serious. And yeah. they need, especially when I did it, I was the only person that anyone had ever met who'd yeah. done it. So I did that. Um, but I was, ve I was respectful about it. You know, and I know people are trying. Mm -hmm. It's one thing if you are just spitefully on purpose not saying the right pronoun. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, people yeah. are trying. Yeah. And I don't get offended by it. Right. But, you know, even sometimes randomly, like my sister or my <laughs> parents yeah. will say the wrong pronoun still. Yeah. And they're like, oh, my God, where did that come from? Like, <laughs> I don't know, but <laughs> knock it off. You know, but here's the other thing. Um, I'm asked a lot, well, what can we do to make trans people more comfortable? And yeah. what, what should we be saying? What should we be doing? Right. And, and I appreciate yeah. people asking that and wanting to know. Yeah. But the fact is, I think transgender people could be doing a lot more to make other people feel comfortable around mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. And that's what I did. That's why my transition, I think, was so successful because I put myself in other people's shoes. Mm -hmm. And... It's really hard now, and I, I feel with this whole, there's, there's not just transgender. That's an umbrella term. And I think people were just starting to grasp male to female, female to male in the pure form. Now it's gender non-conforming. And that's the big thing now where you're on a scale, you know, you're gender fluid. You may feel feminine one day or masculine another day, and you might want to be called this pronoun on one day and this pronoun on another day. And it's really hard for people to be like, what? You know, mm -hmm. it's it's a struggle for a lot of people to comprehend this and, and understand it. And a lot of the younger generation now that are coming out mm -hmm. in this way just are really upset if you don't jump on that bandwagon right away and get those pronouns right. Or they, they want to be called they, you know, mm -hmm. the plural pronoun. And it's really hard for people to adjust. A yeah. friend of mine is a... Um, uh, teacher and therapist and is, is trying and is really conscious, really conscientious about it and always asks me for advice. And, you know, she slips up one time and she's, she's like, oh my God, I felt horrible. The, mm -hmm. the, the person was like shooting knives at me with their eyes and I, mm -hmm. you know, I messed up once and it's like, God, you know, you got to give people a break. Yeah, yeah. And I, I do feel that transgender people need to just loosen up a little bit and mm -hmm. just know people are this is a struggle to understand and that people are trying mm -hmm. and I think um, in general the trans community could be more helpful in, in helping people understand and and mm -hmm. being a little more tolerant mm -hmm. you know we're asking everyone else to be tolerant and we need to be tolerant back mm-hmm yeah, it's definitely, it goes two ways. And, yeah. and you can tell, you can tell when someone's purposely mm -hmm. not getting it right, just mm. to, just to spite you. And yeah. then you can tell when someone slips up and, and is trying. Yeah. And you've got to distinguish and, mm -hmm. and base your reactions according to that. Mm -hmm. And I think like everything else, the more opportunities and exposures that mm -hmm. we, we can just hang out like people, you yeah. know, I think you know, instead of saying uh, transgender people can only hang out with each other, I'm sure there are stories and things that... Um, yeah, it's it's funny, you know, a lot yeah. of people ask me, do you, do you have a lot of transgender friends? And <laughs> to be honest, I don't. Yeah. You know, I, I know a few people. Mm -hmm. My closest friends are not transgender. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter to me. It's right. like I'm friends with the person because of who they are. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, it isn't... Oh, I need to only be around trans, you know, trans people. I, I mean, yeah. hey, it's like it's who the person is. Yeah. If yeah. they happen to be trans, great. If they're yeah. not, fine. It doesn't matter. 
It's funny. People ask me, like, are most of your friends Chinese? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, because you haven't noticed, it's actually much easier to make friends with Americans. And, uh, <laughs> you know, they're not as as large of a supply. Than, and then now, because I, it's so interesting because when you um, witness, like, people are a little bit older, like, in their, say, in their 20s to come to a new country, they tend to be slightly more nervous mm -hmm. or it takes longer to adapt and they tend to hang out with people of their own kind and for a little while anyway. Right. Um, for me, I had no chance. I was 16 years old. I was in the middle of Maine in a town with no more than 20,000 people. So I, I had to make a choice. Uh, you know, that was my own choice mm -hmm. to be able to learn English a little more quickly and, mm -hmm. and all of that. And now I, I'm seeing the reverse effect of, well, now I actually, I s sort of, I say hi where I, I purposely make friends with um, uh, people in the office who are Chinese as well as everybody else mm -hmm. because there's something new I can learn from them mm -hmm. that by not having uh, come to this country at such a young age, I feel like there's sort of that gap in my own yep. knowledge, you know, not yep. having gone through college, there are new words I'm learning every day when I talk to them. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think it's really about, it's easy to say being open-minded, yeah. but how boring will life be? That's right. You know? But just by talking to you, I feel like, you know, there's, a, you know, I feel life is like a kaleidoscope to be able to be exposed to different people, different cultures, you know. Mm -hmm. I came all the way here. And, right. yeah, and love traveling. I think this is just like everything else in life. Um, so it's it's really fluid rather than, you know, putting labels on, on people and events. And, That's right. Yeah you know what what Kevin Costner is so funny I have not referenced him in like 20 years but <laughs> but because of this podcast he said he talked it's so interesting mm. and if you have time I will listen to it um he talks about to canceling out the noise in your own head uh that's a decision that you have to make mm -hmm. and from that point on that's the only way for you to be happy uh is when you can make yourself happy mm -hmm. so I thought it was really powerful uh in a way that because there's like I still hear you know, I meditate at night and I only follow certain people, whether it's podcasting or, mm -hmm. you know, I interview everybody who has so far been on my podcast are my personal collection of mentors. Mm. And I feel like to me, the journey is about sharing my fortune, being, being a woman, being an Asian woman, being, you know, having been living here as, as a teenager and gone through a lot of hardships, mm -hmm. uh, you know, going from contemplating this, you know, having a podcast for years and think that nobody will ever hear this. Nobody cares at all. Like I'm a minority. I, I had all these thoughts. And all of a sudden, after I interviewed um, Dory Clark. Dory. Dory. I just adore I her. her. She's the best. I just want to carry her like on my person. <laughs> now, how did yeah. you, how did you meet her? So I read her book, Stand Out. Stand Out yeah. But Actually, she was then, I, you know, like, you don't really, you don't remember people's names. Like, oh, that was a great book. And I read all her, like, Harvard Business Review mm -hmm. and all these things. But it was from Stephen Shapiro, who was on an earlier episode of my podcast, who's also, like, the National Speakers Association. He's, ama he's amazing. Okay. So, so um, he introduced me to her. And on my podcast with Dory, she's like, I'm on it. You have to talk to Chris Edwards. Oh, yeah, she's yeah. so sweet. She's like, yeah. And then, of course, uh, and I come to work. They're like, wait, we all know who, who Chris Edwards is. I'm like, what? <laughs> What's going on? So. Yeah, she is. She has always. I met her at a conference, at the Grove Street Conference. Mm -hmm. And, uh, like, she invited me to her house for dinner with friends, like, wow. the next day. I'm like, yeah, all right, I'll go. Uh, great. It's the greatest person. And she's, she's so always tried. Cute. She's tried to help me. She tweets. She's quoted me in some of her articles, and she's always tweeting it out, trying to help me. That's gonna be uh, the two her. of us she's going so crazy great. for you now. She's so great. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, and just like hearing from you, I was like, wow. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Like I, I, I'm like, I can't believe she even wants to talk. I, I don't. <laughs> I, I. I'm like, yeah, yeah I'll do it. I, I can't believe that you even want to. Yeah. Like, why me? Okay, sure. You know, it just. I'm I'm still continually surprised when mm. when people uh, you know value the story enough mm -hmm. to to and I'm pleasantly surprised. Mm -hmm. it, make, it does make me feel like it's worth telling and mm. that writing the book was the right decision. And there's I, no question about that now. To 
listen to more episodes of the Face World podcast, please subscribe on iTunes or visit FaceWorld.com. That is F E I S W O R L D, where you can find show notes, links, other tools, and resources. You can also follow me on Twitter at FaceWorld. Until next time, thanks for listening.